What's up guys? Old man out here at SRC Garage tonight. Obviously Billy's video has dropped. I, it looks like everybody's seen it, <laughs> uh, judging by the views in the first eight hours. Um, what I wanna do tonight is I wanna go over Billy's video with everybody. And I would like to try to explain a little bit about what I'm thinking and what I'm doing to keep my son as safe as possible uh, and keep our opponent as safe as possible during these no prep events. Now, obviously, Wilkesboro was tricky. We knew that it was going to be. Everybody knows it was going to be. Uh, and we expected that. We have no complaints. We have zero complaints. We had a wonderful time. We loved it. Um, but, uh, you know, we've been doing this a little while and we've been doing it for the most part the hard way in that, you know, we don't have a lot of uh, data collection. We, well, we don't have any data collection other than a draggy and maybe a GoPro uh, strapped to the back glass of the cab facing the, the dash and the gauges. That's all the data we have ever had. So it's good and bad. Uh, the good thing about it is, is we have no choice but to make that truck work. We have no choice. We have no fallback. There is nothing we can do to just program a, a drive shaft speed curve into the computer and let it ride the dots. We don't have that ability. We, we've never had that. Uh, and I don't really want that in all honesty because in all honesty, traction control, all it's going to do is slow the car down. Now it may save you if your tune up is terrible uh, and you would have had to abort the run, the traction control may save you but it's not going to make you an instant winner. You can't just take an X275 car, throw 500 pounds in the trunk and let it ride the dots and think that you're gonna compete with people uh, that are at the top of this no prep game right now, in small tire especially. And it doesn't matter whether it's the back of the track or whether it's the front half of an unprep track. Uh, they both have their challenges. Uh, but what I want to do tonight is go through some things that I took care of uh, to help Billy this last weekend. And I realize that a lot of people don't have maybe an old hillbilly in bib overalls that does everything the old school way. I'm not saying that I'm smarter than anyone else. I'm not saying I'm better than anyone else. I'm not saying that you should do things exactly how we do them. I'm not saying that we are any kind of an authority whatsoever. What I can say is that my son has a raggedy old S10 sitting over here on the other side of the shop that is very versatile, versatile, however you want to say it. The truck is a contender on the street, on concrete, on back end of the track, on garbage, on good surface, on scraped surface. It doesn't really matter where we take that truck. Girls, quit. Knock it off. Hey, Scrappy, quit. Damn dogs. Uh, it doesn't really matter where we're taking this thing. We always find a way to put down a decent enough pass to get us through a round and, and maybe try and figure things out. So what I want to do tonight is share with you guys a little bit of what we went through this weekend at, at North Wilkesboro, explain to you uh, what I was doing, what I saw, what I experienced, what I told Billy, how we plotted and planned to try and win that $10,000, and I think we could have possibly done it. I can't say for sure, but we, we had a good shot. I think we had a really good shot. So let's get started. 
Let's get to Billy's video. We'll go through it. The track had not been raced on since last season. And this was the first day that cars were gonna go down this track all year. The 60 foot had been scraped clean. And the rest of the track felt like racing on ice. So we brought the RC trucks and we had a few kids stop by the tent, let the kids drive the trucks around. We were having a good time. And of course we wanted to go over and do a little impersonation of Turbo John over his trailer. We love John to death. He's quite a character. I'd go racing with this guy anywhere, anytime. We love you, John. But this was too good not to share. <laughs> Bill, hey, Billy wants to stand here next to your car and talk like you for a minute. Yeah, okay, all right, yeah, yeah. What's up, guys? We're out here at Wilkesboro Dragway. We got the car out here. And Milton's going to be pouring our print for us today. Hopefully, we can get it done. We got some more travel in the car. Got some more weight in it. But, uh, you know, it is what it is. We had been joking on the way down. Uh, about some funny things to do. Um, you know, we, on the way down there, we were discussing that if we go out first round, we would get the RC trucks out and entertain some kids. We would get some good footage regardless. Um, and we had been talking about how much we enjoy racing with John and how funny he is. And we love his Southern accent and, uh, He's just a fantastic person, and we love him to death. And I hope you guys will subscribe to Turbo John on YouTube because he's a fantastic person. And uh, if anybody deserves uh, to retire and do YouTube full-time, it's certainly John Phillips. So anyway, getting back to the racing action here, we were getting ready to go up for first round. And Billy was paired with an orange fourth-gen Camaro. I think... I think it was nitrous. I can't remember. I, I didn't look at the car. Uh, however, the car was pitted just a few cars down from us in the, in the pits. And I, I'm kind of a opportunist, I guess you could say when I ride, I'll go around the pits and I just kind of check out the cars and see what's going on. And this particular car, I noticed that when they were trying to fire it up and back it off the trailer Saturday morning, it would hardly run and it sounded like it had some fouled plugs or something and just didn't sound very good. So not that that necessarily means that it's not gonna make a good lick, but I felt, I felt pretty confident that if it was a nitrous car, it would not be able to run out the back with us. If it is a nitrous car, it's gonna have to 60 foot harder than Billy's truck, and that's gonna be extremely difficult for somebody to come off the trailer and 60 foot with Billy's S10. Um, we felt that the starting line would hold a mid 130 to a high 130, 60 foot early in first round, despite that it wasn't prepped, despite that it was scraped, bare concrete in, in a lot of places. Um, you know, we were on Mickey Thompson's and I've had a lot of people ask, well, you took the, the Phoenixes off. Well, we couldn't get another set of Phoenixes. Um, but I, I'm a firm believer in Mickey Thompson's. I love Mickey Thompson tires um, because I know that a Mickey Thompson 3055S will 60 foot with anybody um, if there's anything to get a hold of. So we put a set of 3055S stiff sidewall Mickey 2810 5s on the truck. They were fresh. They still had stickers on them. And I told Billy, do a very long burnout, as long as you can. Try not to hold it back with the brakes. I'll try to hold the truck straight, and let's put a little rubber patch down, and I'll try and get you back in your tracks as best I can. And that's what we did. Now, one thing that I do is I always go up and watch a handful of pairs before Billy goes up to check the track, see if anybody's leaking, see if anything's dropping on the track. And this happened to be two pairs before Billy went down in the right-hand lane. You can see this little silver S10 here. As it leaves the starting line, there was a considerable amount of dirt and dust that fell out from underneath the bed. Now, I don't know if it had sandbags in the back. I don't know what was going on there with it. And I'm not trying to place blame on anybody. I'm just stating that you can kind of see as it goes down the track, there's a considerable amount of dust um, below the taillights and, and underneath the tailgate. So I don't know what was going on there. I walked out on the track and checked it. 
just before the next pair of cars went down and there was a considerable amount of dust, um, grass, dirt, things of that nature. So I don't know if that little silver truck had a bunch of stuff up in the wheel wells or what happened, but there was definitely something there. And unfortunately that may have contributed to the Mustang, the next pair, cracking the wall in the right-hand lane right in front of Billy. If you don't feel comfortable with that scramble, don't worry about it because it looks slick as shit out there. Yeah. It's like Pacemakers was that first race. It's, um, like, it's like Pacemakers was when Boosted came. So, with the condition of the starting line and things of that nature, um, I knew there was a little bit of dust and dirt up there. So, once again, I reminded Billy uh, to do a long burnout, and I would get him backed up in his tracks as best I could. Um, the other thing is that uh, I reminded him, as you could hear in the video, uh, if you don't feel comfortable with the scramble, don't touch it. And what, what I meant by that and, and what was going on there is that we had a pre-programmed boost ramp in the truck. And before we had gotten up there, uh, before I had seen anything uh, on the track or uh, had that concern, uh, I always tell Billy on your first hit off the trailer, if it feels really good and there's no wheel speed and it's, and it's laid back on the rear tire and it's trucking, just reach down and don't grab the scramble but fade it in. And what I mean by fade it in is instead of just grabbing the button and hold it, bump the button three or four times to bring the dome pressure up gradually and then hold it after the third bump. And what that does, it's just like pulsating nitrous solenoids. Um, uh, it's like progressing in a little extra boost manually. And we do that and I, I try to get him to do that just in case uh, the surface is better than we think it is, and if it'll hold more power, we want to put it down and find out. Um, if it won't hold any more power, we're, we should be safe. In this case, um, you know, I don't know. I don't know if there was uh, a, 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 enough dust and dirt uh, out there on the track. What I thought maybe had fallen out of one of the, the, the that little silver S10. I don't know if that contributed to it or not. But what I do know is that after 330 feet, it was an ice rink. Okay, so once again, we're on stickered slicks, right? Never been down the track. They've not even been scuffed in. So we want to do a nice, long, straight burnout. You notice that the center of the hood is right down the center of the groove. I preach to Billy to please try not to get crazy and don't don't do anything that's going to make the truck turn sideways. If you try to hold it back with the foot brake and drag the front brakes, a lot of times the back of the truck will kick out. That narrows the tire tracks, the burnout marks, and it just ruins the burnout. If you notice how clean and straight the burnout marks ahead of the truck are and look and see just exactly how the front wheels and the tires are lined up in those tracks, you can see he is dead nuts in those tire tracks and he is ready to 60 foot and away he goes. The truck was in the 130, 60 foots right off the trailer, 15th pair down. So you're talking about the, what, seventh or eighth uh, car down the right hand lane. But when it got out there past 330 feet, it was just a total ice rink and he had to pedal it the whole way down. Now, one other thing I wanna mention about first round straight off the trailer. Very, very important. Um, pray to God you're not first pair <laughs> on an instant green tree. That's a tough place to be, and I'm gonna tell you why. Because as a racer, you don't really know what the timeout sequence is, uh, how fast they're gonna click the tree on, how fast the greens are gonna come in, how much time they're gonna give you to bump in if you're the last car to go in. So I had been up on the starting line watching very diligently uh, how quickly the tree would fire after the last car bumped in. And it was almost instantaneous. Um, it's not bad. It's not good. It's That's just the way it is. And it was consistent. So after the first four or five cars, 
uh, I went back and told Billy, I said, if you're the last car to go in, you must be ready to let go of that button. It's got to be on boost, and you've got to be ready to let go of that button the instant you push it down. The instant you push it down, especially against a nitrous car. Because a lot of times, if you're an underdog and you're in a nitrous car and you're facing down a tough competitor, a lot of times uh, they'll roll both bulbs on and then you're on the clock. I mean, you got to get in there before you get timed out. Usually it's seven seconds. Um, but that's not a guaranteed thing, you know. So watch this real quick and, and watch exactly what this Camaro did. He did exactly what we expected him to do and we kind of caught him off guard. Okay, so you can see here, Billy's already pre-staged. His top bulb is on. Now watch the Camaro roll into both beams. Puts Billy on the clock. He's got to get in there quickly. And as soon as he bumps in, the tree flashes and the Camaro wasn't ready. That's what you call live by the sword and die by the sword. These are little tiny details that will make or break you. When you drive eight or 10 hours away from home and you go to someone's home track, that's where they've raced for a long time. Um, and you know, they're accustomed to maybe how they run the program. You're going to expect or you need to expect that this isn't, there is no place for friendships on the starting line. It's non-existent until the wind light comes on at the end. You guys can be friends again then. But when you start to burn out, there are no friendships. That's, that's where the competitive spirit comes in and it is dog eat dog. It is do or die. Only the strong survive. That's just the way it is. Don't cry about it. Don't get upset. If you get hung out, if somebody double bulbs you, You've got to listen carefully in the driver's meeting. You have to pay attention. And you have to learn when something happens, when something bad happens, like we've been double bulbed and hung out, and we remembered it. We learned from it. We didn't go complain. We didn't cry. And we didn't expect a rerun. Um, listen, guys, you've got to learn from mistakes. And for God's sake, learn from someone else's mistakes when and whenever possible those that's that's free tuition you should consider learning from someone else's mistakes free tuition there are people who go into debt thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars to learn these lessons the hard way so if you're up there and you're watching and you see something going on that you know look that guy phew, that that was a rough way to lose learn from it figure out how the next time you go up there, what to watch for, and don't let these things happen to you. Moving on. First round went pretty good. Um, you know, it's pretty slick out there. I kind of expected it. The 60 foot was good, like I expected, but I got about 100 foot out, and it felt like I hit ice. So I pedaled it like six times, and it never really fully hooked up. I was only on 14, 15 pounds of boost. The 60 foot, we're gonna out 60 foot most cars, so. Like, Nobody's getting down this right now. If I can 60 foot and kill people on the light and stay out in front, I think we're going to be all right. I think we're going to win. Now, what he's talking about there is the concept that I have drilled in his head uh, for a long, long time. A lot of times, first round or any round, it doesn't really matter any round, but especially first round. First round will always have the highest percentages of mistakes per pair of cars. First round off the trailer, the percentage of mistakes per pair of cars will be the highest of the entire event. What that means is if you can out 60 foot and you can uh, have a better reaction time than your opponent. You apply copious amounts of pressure early in the run. 
In other words, you show taillights early at 60 feet or 100 feet out. You're pulling away and you're already a car or two out. What you can do, Scrappy, relax. I love you too. What you can do when you apply pressure like that, when you apply pressure like that early in the run, first round or second round or any round, is you can convince your opponent to make a mistake. <laughs> Jesus, Scrappy. You want to go back in the house? That's where you're headed. You can make your opponent, uh, you can force your opponent to show his hand, to grab that second kit, to grab the scramble early, knock the tires off, get it turned sideways, and then it's over. 60 foot and 330 feet on a no prep scrape track, that's where it's at. First round, it's always going to be where the win and the loss occurs because on a on a track that's sat all winter like that uh, even in the best of circumstances it's going to be loose out the back you're never going to really be able to put as much power down out the back as you can on a bare blacktop street it's just a fact so what we were trying to do was 60 foot as hard as we possibly could within reason uh, we didn't want to uh, we didn't want to put it, a lot of wheel speed in it and, and turn it sideways at 60 feet or 330 feet. But we wanted to be aggressive. I'd already, just, I'd already explained that we wanted to be aggressive on the tree, and I explained to Billy that it was going to be quick, so he knew what to expect when he got up there, which he had seen it himself. He had watched a couple of the pairs. But. So our plan of attack is to be aggressive on the light, aggressive in the 60 foot, put as much power down early where we know we can put the power down. And we wanted to be very conservative from 330 feet on with a boost ramp. Um, and that's what we did. Second round, the truck made the fastest pass of the day. It was also the warmest track temperature. The track surface was the warmest during second round. So if there was a round that we could really throw some power down and, and make a good lick, it was gonna be second round, and we did. Now this was the pair right ahead, of, right ahead of Billy. This beautiful 69 Camaro appeared to have kicked a rod out of the oil pan or broke something, I wasn't sure what. And it happened right about 60 to 100 feet out. And I noticed it, I went out and checked the track, I just wanted to make sure there wasn't any oil out there. I blew the inch up in that Camaro. I was just checking to make sure it didn't chuck the rod out and drop oil on it. I need to stick shift drivers. So the next round we had this, what I believe is a big block nitrous Grand Marquis station wagon in the left-hand lane. Um, I knew what our 60 foot was on the first run. I knew that the 60 foot would be better on this run. And that was gonna put us in the low 130, high 120, 60 foot range. And I really felt strongly that this wagon was not going to be able to 60 foot that fast. Uh, and if he did, I really felt like our 330 would be fast enough that we would be out ahead of him and there would be no way for him to come around us on the big end. So as you can see here, the truck's out uh, about two cars at 60 feet. And there was just nothing that the wagon could do to come around us on the other end there. Now, the, we've gotten through second round. Um, Billy said that the truck, although we were very conservative with the boost ramp out the back, um, it did start to lose the tire just slightly as it went through the transition before the finish line. So I knew and Billy knew that this second round pass would likely be the best pass of the day. The sun would begin to start to go down. Uh, the track would start to cool off. The rubber would harden back up. Uh, there was a chance for dew possibly to set in, uh, depending on how late we went. And um, we felt very strongly that um, the 60 foot and a 330 would probably stay there at night. We could probably still 330 what we were doing here uh, in second round. But from this point on, our experience tells us that from this point on, uh, the truck's going to begin to get slower. The track's going to be more and more difficult from half track on. And we were just going to have to play our odds. 
with the boost ramp. We were gonna be conservative out the back. We we're gonna stay aggressive up in the front. Mm, that's my girl, scrappy doo. We were gonna stay aggressive. Jesus, please. We were gonna stay aggressive up front and continue to be conservative out the back. And in fact, Billy actually turned the truck down uh, pretty aggressively from 330 feet on third round. And it kind of set a trap for the, the, the Mustang in that he could see the truck start to nose over and you just have to watch this. It's hard to watch. It sucks to watch. But as Turbo John says, it is what it is. Now, as we were preparing for third round, the sun's going down and there was a little bit of a fussing argument there uh, with, the, with the promoter of the event. There was somebody upset about um, something. I don't know what they were crying about, but they were wasting a lot of time and the sun was going down and I was highly concerned with the track temperature. I had actually driven the scooter out onto the track all the way almost to the finish line, dragging my feet to feel where the groove was where the track was still sticky, where it wasn't, and if there was anything out there. I felt highly confident that we were gonna be just fine to 330 feet, but from there on, we absolutely had to be conservative. So you'll notice here, uh, as Billy goes into high gear, uh, you can actually hear the truck start to lay down and it's the boost ramp going away. He put about two cars, almost three cars on the Mustang early. And as Billy's boost ramp starts to lay down, it makes an appearance to the Mustang that he can grab the scramble to get around him. And the problem was he grabbed the scramble out no man's land, out past 330 feet where the track had gotten into the shade. The track temperature had dropped dramatically and it was just a, a fatal error on the, on the driver's part. It's, um, it's devastating to watch, uh, you know, somebody crash their car like this, but um, what we can do here and, I, and what I hope to preach to everybody or hope to teach to everyone is you have to learn to race your lane. You have to learn to race your lane. And I'm not trying to be critical of anybody at all, but Billy knew, uh, we knew specifically that there was no power to, there was no traction to be had. There was no power to be put down past 330 feet. So we were extremely aggressive up front and played our odds on the back end and uh, it came out good for us, but not so good for the other team. Um, I feel terrible about it. Uh, we feel terrible for the young lady who got injured by flying debris off the car. But, um, you know, these are, these are risks that we take at the track when we go racing. Uh, it's dangerous. Very unfortunate incident. Um, the TKM guys are awesome. I was really looking forward to that race. It was pretty close. I mean, I was probably out on him by two, three cars at the most. Um, and my truck, when it hit the transition, it lifted up in the back end and started spinning. He could see it. because you know, He seen my truck lift up and get squirrely, so he grabbed a scramble to try to get around me. And he was a little bit to the left of the groove, and it just went towards the wall, and he, there was nothing he could do to save it. Uh, so I just want to reiterate that the video that I'm doing tonight the information that I'm relaying and what I'm saying to everyone tonight here on YouTube is absolutely not meant to be critical of anyone. Okay. What I'm trying to do is I'm trying to help some of these young guys that are, that are wanting to get into this, that want to get into this back into the track or no prep racing. It's a fantastic time. The, the people that are in it are, are fantastic. And I just, I can't reiterate how much we love it. But, um, you know, while we do not have all the fancy electronics, 
uh, and data recorders and wheel counters and drive shaft monitors, speed counters and all that. We don't have any of that. But what we do have is a young man who is an extremely talented driver. And I am very, very, very uh, detail oriented when it comes to paying very close attention to track temperatures. And, you know, I'm not out there with a laser uh, infrared thermometer or anything like that. It's not like you have to be some kind of data collection device, but you do need to use common sense. Uh, you do need to have a little bit of uh, background in, uh, in, in what you're doing. And luckily, uh, you know, over the last few years, we've been very fortunate. We've had a good time. We've traveled the country and we've raced a lot of different places with a lot of different people and a lot of different circumstances, a lot of different temperatures on different tires. And we've learned a lot, uh, most of it the hard way. Um, but, you know, guys, you can have the best of everything. You can go out and spend $150,000 and have the best electronics, the best uh, fuel system, the best transmission, the best dump valve, the best converter kit. You can have the best of everything. But what matters is how much are you getting out of what you have, okay? I would say that Billy and I get about every ounce. <laughs> There's we, we get every crumb of everything left on the table out of that little truck. One way or the other, we find a way. We don't have the, the best engine, okay? We don't have the best cylinder heads, the biggest cam, the best biggest turbos, and, you know, we don't have the best of everything. The chassis is definitely not the best of everything but we don't get lost. We don't make too many changes at once. We're very analytical and I'm very stubborn. I don't let my son do anything stupid for the most part. <laughs> it's, it's easy to get lost, guys. It's, it's extremely easy to get lost. It's extremely easy to listen to uh, internet uh, wizards. I don't claim, I don't claim to be uh, an authority I don't claim to be uh, an intelligent person. I don't claim to be anything like that. I do feel that we have a good bit of common sense, and uh, it's 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 served us well. But if you don't have an old timer out there with you, if you don't have a dad or a grandpa that's done everything the hard way and has learned how to figure things out without a laptop or without a computer. Um, it might be difficult. You know, you're going to have to probably uh, rely on information that you get from other people. And a lot of people are all doing the same thing with the same electronics and the same uh, tires and, and everything. That's why we tried Phoenix tires the other day. Unless you want to run better than everybody else, you better find a way to do it better than everybody else. You're going to have to go out on a limb and you're going to have to test and you're going to have to work hard at it. Um, and we don't mind doing that. And I don't mind sharing some of our experiences and, and trying to help people. Um, like I told a lot of people down there at Wilkesboro this weekend, I had a few few people ask, why do you tell people how you're doing this? And why do you give out the information on the chassis? And it's very simple because a lot of, uh, a lot of young guys approach me at the track and some of them emotional. Uh, I've had guys come up and hug me in, in tears. Uh, and I'm not talking about... Um, I'm not talking about soft people. I mean, these are these are these are boys who grew up hard. They don't have anything. They never have had anything. They're, but they want to do this. They want to race. They want to compete. And they just don't have that grandfather with them anymore. They don't have their dad with them anymore. Whatever the case may be. And they, for whatever reason, they watch these videos and they somehow connect with my family and they identify with maybe how I talk or some of the old terms that I use, whatnot, I don't know. But this sport and, uh, and this lifestyle has been very good to my family. People support us well beyond what we deserve, in my opinion. 
And uh, I don't want to be someone, I don't want my family to be known as someone that just takes from, the, from a lifestyle or a, a bunch of culture vultures. Uh, I want to give back. I want to see the sport succeed. I want to see people do well. I want to see fathers out there with their sons or their their grandkids and their their grandfathers. And I want to I want to see people experience what I've experienced, what I've got to experience with my kids. Um, yeah, I'm gonna get off here. I'm I'm kind of rambling, but uh, I know this is gonna be a little bit of a long video. I hope I hope some of the information that I've given out tonight helps some of you guys, maybe even some of the guys that have been doing it for a while. Um, hopefully, uh, it, it helps people race better. Uh, hopefully it helps some safety things. Uh, maybe people learn a few little things that might save someone's car, might save someone's life. I don't know. Uh, but that's the goal. So hope you enjoyed the video. I know I'm a little long winded tonight, but I got to get in and get to bed. I got to get up in the morning and uh, I'm going to do a little excavating tomorrow for the first time in a while. Uh, the Lord's blessed us with some decent weather and my phone's been ringing and I got to get back to it. So see everybody tomorrow.